Hi, Shannon Waller here, and welcome to Inside Strategic Coach with Dan Sullivan. Dan, today you are showing me a brand new exercise that sounds really interesting, especially for clients, entrepreneurs who are looking at really creating new capabilities, but having a filtering mechanism or a way of assessing how profitable they're going to be. Mm -hmm. And you call this a profitability maximizer. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to know where, well, we'll talk through the idea and the thinking tool, but I'd love to know where did the need for this exercise come from? What prompted you to come up with it? Well, I think it's, I'm interested in technologies. First of all, I've got a an explanation uh, or uh, answer to your question that involves the world as a whole and then just related to our particular company and to the specific businesses that our entrepreneurial clients have. So the big thing is that all new capabilities start with somebody having a vision about something in the future that the reality of it doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, the people who have this are very, very persuasive, and they can talk about it in such a way that they give the impression that the new capability is just around the corner, and you don't want to miss out, so you want to, you know, it's like an offering in the investment community. They'll get people to invest right away. But what I noticed is that I want to have credibility. You know, people look to me as a strategic coach, they look to me when they bring up a topic of a new type of technology or something's just around the corner, mm -hmm. that I can give them some framework for actually evaluating just how true it is that it's going to be a breakthrough. But the other thing is that it may be a breakthrough and it's being talked about like it's right around the corner, but it may be 10 years off. And my feeling is that there's certain boxes that have to be checked before something is really a profitable success. And so that's from the standpoint where other people are trying to engage you, mm -hmm. you know, that there's a new capability and they would like you to invest in it or put a down payment mm -hmm. on it. And I think we have to become wiser and wiser as individuals, not anything, but what sounds like it's gonna be really good and it's gonna be here and usable pretty quick and what's kind of a prediction. You know, it's kind of a guess, and it might be interesting to talk about, but it's not interesting to actually invest money in it or time or anything like that. So that's just the world in general. But the other thing for us here at Strategic Coach, you know, we create a lot of new capabilities. We have a lot of individuals in the company that create new organizational capabilities, new technological capabilities, new communication capabilities. And what I'm looking for is a structure, whether it's myself or you or anyone else, that you have a very solid way of actually developing and creating the new capability where you're not over-promising mm -hmm. and you're going step by step and the very progress you're making is providing energy. It's providing increased confidence for yourself, for your team, and for other people. My feeling is that we've entered into a period in the world where creating new capabilities is going to be a pretty normal thing on a continual basis. So anyway, I had the opportunity of someone who's creating a entirely new kind of event in the marketplace. This is a very specific multiple-day event where a certain kind of breakthrough part of science and technology is being utilized. And I simply utilized the framework that we we're describing here. And they were amazed at how comprehensive it was and allowed them to think about their event from many different angles that they ordinarily would not have done. And they could immediately see that there were things that they knew that they had already proved that they could take advantage of very quickly. Mm -hmm. But there were many things that they didn't know where they were going to require who's, you know, in our language and strategic coach, who, not how, they were going to have to call on expertise that they did not have. So they could make progress 
because they're clear about what they already know about this, but they could also make progress because they could very quickly attract and take advantage of the knowledge and capabilities of other people. So it was my first test model where I actually applied it to someone else's new capability, and they were thrilled. They were actually thrilled with the conversation. That's so interesting, Dan. And it strikes me that this period of time, who knows how long we'll keep going for, probably a while, is that there are so many new capabilities coming at us. You know, if you're on your phone, if you're watching anything or reading anything or listening to anything, there's new opportunities for new capabilities. That's in air quotes. (laughs) And having a way to filter them. This is something that I think companies need to have as capability, teams need to have, people need to have for their own, you just even as a consumer, but also as a creator and as someone who is, you know, wanting to persuade other people of the validity and the profitability of your ideas, mm-hmm. but not having a framework in which to do it. So let's talk through the P's, of which there are a few. English is a great language for finding words that have a resonance with each other. So I describe the checkpoints. There's 10 checkpoints, and they each start with the letter P, and each of them ends with BLE. So the first one is plausible. Okay. So we start there, and that, you know, this is the starting point for any new idea that you're seeing something in the future that the innovator or the inventor whoever wants to create the capability has the ability to see things in the future as if they're already real, you know, and they're very excited, you know, emotionally, they're almost committed already to it, Mm -hmm. but there is no reality. There's no evidence yet that such a thing is even realistic. So I call this term plausible. Plausible means that you can imagine it, you can see Mm -hmm. it and it's plausible. And a lot of people think plausible means it's inevitable, but obviously we have hundreds of examples like flying cars, that we're all going to have flying cars. Well, it was actually possible there were actually flying cars in the 1940s, but it hasn't caught on, and it's 80 years and it hasn't really caught on. Mm -hmm. So it's plausible, and as we go up the piece, it's actually possible and it's actually provable. But there are forces having to do with what people would feel good about and what they would find useful that just hasn't supported this idea. Yeah, that makes total sense. So you see it and it's intriguing and it's worth a try. So a project that you would actually engage with will go on to possible. So plausible is the first thing. And plausible is not the same thing as possible. Okay, plausible is just that you can engage with it in your mind. Okay. And you can talk about it and people would say, oh, I don't think so. Or other people would say, oh, that'd be really neat and everything else. But you can tell there's really no level of commitment for the vision. Mm -hmm. It needs a lot more work before you can get it to the point where you can actually engage people in a practical way. Yeah, interesting, Dan. So possible is committed and courageous. You're starting the work. Yeah. And then tell me about provable. This is interesting. Well, possible. Now you've actually started to take the vision and you're trying to bring it about. Okay. And I say, first of all, you have to be committed to it because you have to now devote time to it that is above and beyond what other time you're committed to other things. So it requires a commitment to spend the time. You don't have the capability and confidence yet of the finished project. Mm -hmm. So wherever you don't have capability and confidence, you have to put courage in there. You have to move forward and it's internally driven. You're not being supported from the outside yet, but it's possible. And then what you want to as quickly as possible get to the third step where it's provable, Mm -hmm. okay? And you can prove with, you know, objective evidence that what you're proposing actually works. You know, we have many, many different realms where there's new capabilities. Some of them are technological capabilities. Well, you would have to have the technological proof that it actually works, you know, or a scientific 
breakthrough, you have to have evidence and there's objective standards about that it's judged. So right there, you can see that there's a lot of work that has to go before that vision you had, you know, it's grounded in reality and you have to think about how can we prove this as soon as possible that it's actually real, you know? Yeah, it's interesting, Dan, if I think about, you know, you'll have an idea and you'll broach it in the workshop and you prove whether or not it works in conversation with other people. Mm -hmm. That's how you do that with your ideas. Now, technology or science has to have some other markers in their world. Or a product or, you know, anything like that. But the whole point is that you're not going to pass the first acceptance threshold Mm. just on the basis of the idea or that you're working on it. You have to actually have evidence that someone outside of yourself Mm -hmm. says, yeah, I see that this actually works. So the next one, Dan, is permissible. And I think this is probably where a lot of ideas die. Yeah, (laughs) They don't make it past this part. So what does permissible mean? It's against the law. That's pretty straightforward. Well, I'll give you an example. And Peter Diamandis is a great example with his first private spacecraft that he created uh, XPRIZE for. You know, it was the first private spacecraft that went into technically what space is. And there's uh, altitude away from the Earth. You know, it's in 60, 70 miles. I'm not quite sure what the thing is. And you have to prove First of all, you have to create a spacecraft that goes that high, and then it comes back and it lands. And within two weeks, you do it again with not more than 20% replacement of the parts on the original flight. You can't change more than 20% of the parts. And, you know, they had dozens and dozens of competitors, and one of them won it. But when he started the contest to do this. There was a $10 million contest, and there were two problems with it. He didn't have the $10 million for the prize. That had to be created as part of the project. But the other thing was, it was forbidden by the Federal Aeronautics Administration Mm -hmm. to have a private vehicle go into outer space. It was against the law. So he had to get the law changed, and he had to get his $10 million to do it. You know, so one thing you want to check out, you know, that what you're doing is not running the foul of regulatory issues that could stop you. You know, it may be a great idea and people are very excited about it, but it's just not acceptable uh-huh. by the law. And they did change the law for him. Which they is- did. Well, he got to the chief administrator and she said, oh, yeah, it's kind of antiquated. And it's time to do this. So she, they changed the law. Very cool. So that sort of gets it. I want to use another flight analogy, off the ground. <laughs> okay. But then it needs to be protectable, Dan. And you've, you've spent a lot of time getting to know this world very well. Yeah, protectable means that if you're creating something new and you're breaking new ground with it, you want to make sure that you take the proper steps, and these are legal steps, that 100% you own the property, the intellectual property. And this shows up... You know, and what we're talking here, it shows up as copyrights, trademarks. It's a proprietary innovation. This is new on the planet. Mm -hmm. And you're the owner. You're the owner of this innovation, this new capability. For example, we'll show the actual worksheet that goes along with my explanation here. So our system, so I did this and... The artist got finished and has all the words, has all the design set. And the moment that happens, she sends it to our IP, our intellectual property department. And that afternoon, this new thing, which is only a day old in its creation, has already been logged in as a copyright application. Okay. So everything new that we do in Coach Uh, especially everything that's used in coaching entrepreneurs. Same day now, the moment we're set on the design, it automatically, the copyright goes in, and then we'll take a look. It may deserve a trademark, which takes a longer period of time. And we have one over the past year, the certainty uncertainty tool, which I think is patentable, that we can actually get a patent on this. Very cool. But you have to be sure that you're, new capability is protectable. 
So it's permissible. That's looking at the law from one direction. Does the law even permit it? Yeah. But the other thing is that you have to use the law to protect yourself, intellectual property law. That's fascinating. The really great thing is as soon as you put the C with a circle around it, it's copywritten. Then you can register the trademark, which is what we do Mm -hmm. instantly. And then it can be trademarked and all the other things. So the law is on your side if you do the right things and if it's permissible, which is interesting. Yeah. And I just want to say that the most powerful IP law in the world is American intellectual property law, because American corporations are everywhere on the planet. But if you read, it's right in the first article of the Constitution of the United States, that the main reason for the law is actually to disseminate throughout society new ideas, new methods, Mm -hmm. new technologies. And in order to do that, we've got to give the inventor and the innovator a time period where they get the benefit and they get rewarded for their innovation. So Mm -hmm. a lot of people think that it's designed just to protect the innovator, but it's actually the main purpose is that the society gets smarter and more capable as a result of encouraging innovation. I love that. And it, yeah, it's an incentive. It protects you from just creating stuff and having mm-hmm. someone else take advantage of it. You know, there's tons of stories of entrepreneurs who've crashed and burns or even entertainers who didn't protect their own IP and it was owned by somebody else. So this is really key. I even just saw an article this morning about the number of, these are actually musicians who are copywriting their own phrases, their own terminology, the names of their albums. And it was kind of like, as this is a wild thing. And in my head, I'm like, that's a really normal and smart thing to do. (laughs) So for us, we really, you've really got this down and you have for a long time. But if you don't do it, the costs are so high. So Dan, the next one's pretty interesting. And I love how they're stacking on top of one another. This is really cool. So we've got plausible, possible, provable, permissible, and protectable. The next one is priceable. Yeah. Now, this is, this is a fun use of the word. Yeah. And again, this is, if we're talking about profitability, maximum profitability, well, the most essential ingredient is that you have a price for the new capability that allows you to make a profit. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the first things, you know, that I check out with anything new that I create. One is I test immediately on the likely person who would write the check for it. So check writers, I said, I don't check out on team members. I don't check on with friends and family and my private life or anyone like that. I only test a new idea on the person who would actually pay for it because they want to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done it for years. I've done it, you know, in terms of coach Pricing for a coach, I've been at it since, you know, mid-1970s. And I've got a pretty good sense of where's the right place to start with the pricing. And the thing is that I never go low with price. I always go high with price because it tells me that I want the customer to buy this. I want them who they see such value in the new capability that they don't see it as a cost. They immediately see it as an investment. So Right. They don't see it as a cost. People who see it as a cost, I'm not interested in having as customers. Ooh, that's so good. That's so good. And again, that's a trap that people fall into is they undervalue it or they're so desperate to have it get out that they don't put an appropriate price. Well, it's almost like they're operating at a loss before they even have the new capability out there because they didn't price it right. And it's very, very crucial that you get a sense. And people are scared, you know. It's one of the things I've noticed that people are afraid of getting immediate clarity on what the price is that would work for this product. But I find it undermines their confidence for developing the new capability. I think it also undermines the confidence of the person buying it. Yeah. As you said, you don't want people who are cost focused, you know, as clients. You want people who are really focused on the value. Then they're looking at it a lot like a commodity, but they're looking at it as an investment for how it's going to help multiply them. Well, here's the thing. I'm not Walmart. You know, I'm not competing on price. I'm not Amazon. I'm not competing on price. I'm in a business where we're providing a 
powerful service to very successful, affluent entrepreneurs. Yeah. Okay. So we're not going for the bottom of the market here. We're going for the top of the market. If you're going for the bottom of the market, you still have to price it so that you can make a profit on volume. Right. hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love that. Dan, next one is packageable. And packaging is one of the things I've learned a ton about from you. I'm appreciator of great packaging. So what does being packageable mean in this context? Well, that the way the new capability is presented to the marketplace, to buyers, it looks good, it feels good, it's attractive, it draws you in. We're very sensual. I mean, human beings are very sensual, you know. We like things that sound right, look right, feel right, Mm -hmm. and everything like that. Before you start developing it, it it's an interesting thing that was learned afterwards after Steve Jobs died at Apple, that he never started by designing the product. He started by designing the box that the product was going to come home in and what it felt like to open that box. And I remember it was kind of like after they had done two or three iPods when it was back, you know, in the 80s with iPods or early 90s. And I used the iPod, that particular iPod for maybe you know, a year or two years, and I moved on. But I kept the box for about 15 years because it was such a beautiful box. You know, and everything that Apple does, before you even get your hands on the product, you're so admiring of the packaging, you know, and their stores and what their stores look like. And that is that they realize that people love things that, you know, they look yummy, you know, from a (laughs) central standpoint now. I feel good just carrying the package. You know, I feel good, you know, and everything. And we're very influenced by packaging. Could not agree more. I laugh because I have the same Apple boxes. It's hard for me to throw them away. And it's just such a pleasure. And apparently the inside of Apple devices are also just Yeah, well, he would tell his engineers, he said, show me what the inside looks like. And they said, well, what does it matter? The customers will never see the inside. And he says, no, but we'll know, we'll know that the insights look good. Okay. I mean, I think, you know, people like that who are legendary, they're also a bit fanatical. So that wouldn't be somebody else's concern, but it was his concern. And they are the single most profitable company in the world. You know I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, they're the highest valued stock of any company in the world, but no one matches their profit margins. Yeah. And they said design tone that has, my estimation, has yet to be replaced, which is very cool. Mm-hmm. Dan, the next one is producible. So this means that once you've got something that you, again, have protected and priced and packaged, but now it has to be something you can replicate and make more of. Is that right? Yeah. So let's say you make something and it's a big hit and the market just wants any amount that it can get its hands on, but you don't have the ability to meet the demand. Mm -hmm. You don't have the ability to supply your brand new capability in such a way that it meets the demands of a eager market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of people have fallen down on that issue because they had a plan A, which was to get it out to the market. They didn't have a plan B. What if the market wants a hundred times what you've Created, you know, can you actually meet the demand? We're seeing that now that we've gone virtual with Strategic Coach, we're not limited by is there a conference space that we can have? Can the travel schedule happen? And do the cost of a workshop justify? You know, the cost of a global virtual workshop is the same for every workshop Mm -hmm. and it's very low, you know, so it's very, very producible. Exactly. We were saying the other day, there's just the number of workshops that can happen in one day all over the world. (laughs) It's pretty, pretty amazing. Dan, the last two are also pretty interesting for me. Preferable. Yeah. Tell me about preferable. Well, usually you're creating something where there's an existing, not so good solution to a particular issue. Okay. There's something that already exists and you're putting out something now, I'll give you an example. BlackBerry looked like BlackBerry was going to be the world beater, 
because they had the first kind of manageable in your hand phone, you know, but you had to hit buttons. A lot of the space of the device was made up of just the little keyboard. And, you know, people really had to learn how to use their thumbs really on the keyboard. And Apple figured out, well, you don't have to have a keyboard. You just have to have on the screen what looks like a keyboard and just have a pressure sensitive thing. And they just wipe BlackBerry out just like that, you know. BlackBerry would have to completely re-engineer itself to actually keep any position in the marketplace. And then others copied Apple, but Apple stuff is always more beautiful. They just have an ability to do it. So the the big thing here is that it's preferable. Mm -hmm. It's preferable. And that means it's superior to anything out there. And there's authoritative influencers yeah. say, no, 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 hands down, this is the best out there. Now, the thing to think about here, you don't get to the preferable stage, which is number nine in my checklist, unless you've done the first eight really well. Exactly. And because some of the, what you can price for it and whether or not it's preferable has to do with how well it's designed and packaged, right? Mm -hmm. So these are all stacking on each other, mm -hmm. which I find really interesting. You know, I just going to riff on Apple for a second because I remember there was a world-class, I believe it was a football soccer team getting off a bus and to a person, they were wearing Apple AirPods. Mm -hmm. Like you're talking about an influencer. <laughs> That's what they were wearing. And so there's just this reinforcement from people that others are looking to that this, in fact, is the product that you want to get. Cool kids prefer this. Exactly. Yeah. Well, All the cool, cool kids. kids in the world, regardless of what they're doing, prefer this over any yes. other solution. And that's preferable. That's a very important point. Very preferable. Your last one, Dan, is palpable. And I'm super curious to hear what you have to say about this one. Well, palpable means... You love it. Those for whom it really matters just want it. And price is not a really important issue at all. They just want to get their hands on it, you know. And that's when you really have a kind of a viral product. You know, the product is really, you know, there's lots of things that we have in our lives. There's been short-term crazes for something, and but it was sort of a, a fashion. But usually it's things that have a iconic style, you know, that usually become palpable. We love certain things. And we're passionate about them. We're very passionate about them. We develop a, a real loyalty, a real brand loyalty uh -huh. to those things. So the thing that I want to say about the 10 Ps that I put here, first of all, it's kind of, you know, whimsical because how did he find 10 words with P that end in B-L-E? And I said, well, you have to start early in life being comfortable with dictionaries. And <laughs> there's things like homonyms and synonyms and, you know, certain things that are secret tunnels in the language. Yeah. But the big thing is that each of the P's is very distinct. There's no real overlap, real overlap between the P's. But the other thing is that I noticed because I just had a success about three hours ago with a brand new capability in the world. And what I noticed was the quality of the discussion mm -hmm. with the team. There was a team there. They said, wow, boy, what we can think of when we use these as the criteria. And I think the big thing is that so much of the thinking about marketing and positioning is very quantitative. It's very quantitative. It's very technological. Mm -hmm. But actually, what the profitability maximizer really does is that you get a 360 degree, it's a 360 spherical sense of this new thing that you're creating in the world. And you want to give it maximum right from the start as you design the new capability that you give it maximum possibility to be a success, mm -hmm. a maximizer success very profitable. And I think that the checkpoints kind of ensure and encourage that you'll talk about the right things here. I find that so useful, Dan, because there's a set of criteria, right? And you can instantly almost look at something and go check, 
not checked, done, not done, (laughs) in place yet, Mm -hmm. no idea. It just gives you this template for knowing how to develop things in an order that makes sense. Like you have to do one, two, and three before you do four, five, and six. So it's this incredible framework. And I want to talk about the scoring as well, because the scoring is not linear. Yeah. Well, I have a value score. In other words, at each of these stages, starting from the beginning, the value of your capability keeps going up. There's a score. And just to make it very simple, but at the same time, introduce the concept of multiplier, I have 10 checkoff points, and I number them 1 through 10, but each of the numbers is squared. So 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, so you have 4, 9, 16, 25. And the last one is 10 squared, and it's 100. And I said, that's kind of neat. It starts with 1, and it goes to 100. So you can see that there's been an exponential increase of value as you've added these 10 considerations that you've thought through and satisfied the requirements for each one of these. So I love it. It's one squared, two squared, um, three squared. That's really interesting. Yeah. And then you can rate, you can pick a list of some things that you're working on and see where it's at. Is that right? Yeah. And you can do this to existing capabilities. For example, you have an existing capability, but it hasn't done quite what you thought it was going to do. And you can reverse engineer, you can reverse analyze the capability and you'll see that you're weak in certain number of the categories. That an existing capability would be much more profitable. You would maximize it. If you will go back and correct one of the 10 criteria, you didn't really get the price really right. And you really haven't proven it in such a way that it would be immediately obvious that this is a great thing. And then you would say, well, how could we do that? And then all sorts of specialties, Mm -hmm. you know, skill specialties and knowledge come into this. And you can be doing it forever. You can be taking what you've already created and keep improving the profitability of the new thing. Well, it seems exciting to me that when you take an existing capability, probably some tweaks to either protection or price or packaging could dramatically amplify something and to the point where you can get it to be palpable. Yeah. One of the areas where I really notice that most entrepreneurs don't get the impact when they're creating new capability is that they haven't protected it legally. It's not really their property. Mm-hmm. And they're worried, I don't want to get it out there too well known because people can steal it. So they're not getting the protection right to copyright, trademark, patent right they've probably diminished enormously their confidence about their own new capability. They're afraid, well, I don't want to get this real big. That's not the reason why I did it. And I said, the reason why you're saying that you don't want it too big is because you're not sure you could protect it if somebody else stole it and made it really big and you wouldn't have a leg to stand on if you said, well, that's my product. It's so interesting, Dan. I can remember conversations with very specific entrepreneurs about putting something into the form of a book and packaging it that way. And they're like just under the waterline. And I can see that if they can package it, you know, into a book, sell it on Amazon, do all the things, their idea could totally shoot up, but they're just hesitating, probably because it's not protected. And they just hadn't seen this vision. So I'm excited about this model, because I think it's powerful when you're going to a conference, someone's throwing new ideas at you. We're exposed to, you were exposed to a ton of scientific and health and technological breakthroughs all the time. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a framework for assessing where something is at, as well as our own company and how we're going to do this. So if someone's going to just kick off into gear with these 10 Ps, I'm going to say them again, just in case someone's taking notes, they can grab them. So first of all, idea needs to be plausible, then possible, provable, permissible, allowed by law, (laughs) protectable, priceable, packageable, hopefully beautifully, producible and preferable so it becomes palpable. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to take action on this right away with this idea, Dan, what would you recommend? Well, I think that it's very helpful because this is going to become standard language in strategic coach. And, you know, we'll show what the form looks like. We can put that up on the screen. 
But we're at the stage right now where it's not completely protected. So we're going to give you a screenshot, but we're not actually going to let you download it yet because it's not protected yet. And we want to test it more with our own check writers to make sure that it is. But what I want to say here is that I would say probably 100 attempts by entrepreneurs to create a new capability doesn't become as profitable as they want or profitable at all, simply because they haven't checked all the boxes mm -hmm. of preparing their new capability to go out into the world and be powerful and have tremendous impact. And I've just learned from trial and error, usually grueling trial and painful error, that the world is not gentle towards new capabilities. You know, there's no vacuums out there to fill. There are some things out there. So you have to have a new creature that's got um, a lot of muscle when you go out there. But I'm very pleased with this. You know, uh, I have to tell you, just following the two-hour walkthrough with one new event, one, as I felt personally enormously useful with this, but I had a feeling that there was a comprehensiveness to these 10 considerations and that, you know, the, the entrepreneurs that I was working with, they said, you know, we wouldn't have thought about half these things that you brought up, but they're very easy to talk about and very easy to understand. But under normal circumstances, we would have charged ahead and then we would be caught up at the last minute that we hadn't done certain things. And I said, yeah, and all this happens behind closed doors. You can do most of the stuff behind closed doors. But when the show opens, you want to make sure that the new creature that you're sending out on stage is capable, confident, you know, one of a kind, unique, powerful. Creates value. Transformative, yeah. I love it. Well, Dan, thank you. It's it's kind of very fun to be introduced to a, a tool that's new and sharing this thinking. And I think it simplifies the complexity quite dramatically of coming up with new ideas, but also, frankly, just filtering out all the new things that are coming across our plates all mm -hmm. the time. So I appreciate that from a multitude of perspectives. Thank you. Well, thanks for taking me through it. This is the first time that I've had a tour through it, you know, and you ask questions that struck you as useful to know. So I appreciate it. And we can send this out after we introduce it into our strategic coach workshops. We can send this out as a context provider, a persuader of the context of what we've created here. Yay. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Shannon.